Now, Canada's oil sands, or tar sands as they're often called, represent one of the world's leading reserves of crude oil. Extracting it, however, is a dirty business, heavy in CO2 emissions and energy consumption. Canada's First Nations have been on the front line staging protests against the pipelines that transported from landlocked Alberta. But a group of 10 or so Indigenous communities have now offered to buy equity in a pipeline, saying it's the only way left to them to try and mitigate the environmental impact. Good or bad idea? Well, to give us his perspective is Julian Brave Noise. Cat, born in California, a descendant of the Lilwat Nation of Mount Curie and U.S. policy uh, analyst at Environmental Campaign Group 350.org. Mr. Noiscat, thanks for your time. Can I firstly get your opinion on that situation with the tar sands in Canada? Such a massive problem. And now to hear that those who were on the front line protesting to stop it ever starting production are now perhaps going to set up their own pipeline. Have we gone too far to roll this back? I don't think that we've gone too far. You know, I think that um, when we're talking about the history of native peoples in America, um, we're talking about a long history of people fighting for their survival by whatever means necessary. Uh, and so to criticize a, a group that, that wants to stop the pipeline by, uh, you know, purchasing a stake in it or to mitigate its, um, its impacts on their community is, I think, to misunderstand that they've been fighting for survival for for decades. But is that what they want to do to reduce the amount of oil bring bring it out? Like, what, how might this help? I think it's more about um, I, I think it's more about ha having their rights and the the interests of their community, you know, respected by the pipeline. You know, if the pipeline is going to happen, regardless, I think that they're thinking not not my own thinking, but they're thinking. Uh, is probably that being, you know, a stakeholder in the project uh, properly gives them the the leverage to do that. And overall, in Canada, do you think that these First Nations rights are sufficiently expected? There had been another uh, pipeline plan, but indeed the court, you know, stopped it at a certain point, saying, "Well, hang on, you have to. It, this is going through, you know, the land of these indigenous communities." Yeah. So the, the Canadian Constitution, there's a section of the Canadian Constitution called Section 38. Uh, that basically says that the rights of First Nations peoples need to be uh, respected, uh, especially in the economic development pro process. Um, obviously, Canada could not have been built uh, on basically stolen indigenous lands if that has what has happened for the vast majority of Canadian history. So it's much more of an aspiration still than a, than a reality. Um, but increasingly, especially in the courts, uh, we're seeing uh, stronger recognition and, and protection for Indigenous rights. And when it comes to these uh, tar sands, how worried should we be? I mean, you're an environmental activist. Uh, you know, oil is money. Everybody's addicted to it. So, you know, is there any way to try and prevent the, the extent of the damage that's being done? Yeah, so I think it's important for people to know that the tar sands is a particularly dirty form of energy because, you know, it's in the name tar sands, the way that they have to... Uh, process it. It requires, actually, it's very energy intensive and it it's very, has heavy environmental impacts. Um, so, you know, we're not just talking about any sort of normal normal source of energy. This is a very climate heavy impact uh, and environmental impact heavy source of energy. And I think what uh, First Nations are, are recognizing is that uh, if they want to maintain their way of life, you know, their ability to hunt in their traditional territories, uh, you know, fish in clean rivers, you know, even drink the water that comes from the tap where they live, um, these pipelines and, and the oil and gas industry are a real threat to that. Uh, but those industries, of course, uh, are backed by massive lobby groups. You're the US policy analyst uh, for 350.org. I mean, you know, give us an idea of what they're up against. Yeah, I mean, they're up against perhaps the most powerful industry in the, the history of the world. Uh, in the U.S., you know, you, you can't talk about the oil and gas industry without talking about an industry that is powerful enough to take on science itself, right? Like, uh, you know, some of the biggest funders of oil and gas and some of the biggest players in the U.S. political system are people like... Um, the Mercer family, the uh, Koch brothers, you know, these big names who basically are, are backing uh, climate denial and, and the denial of scientific consensus in order to support their profit interest. So what is the solution? Is it, is it that we, we go back to the individual action or? 
So I think, yeah, I think the solution is is we need to follow the lead of the communities that are on the front lines of these fights, uh, that are that are standing up for really common sense ideas. You know, the notion that I should be able to drink clean water from my tap. The notion that. Uh, you know, if we keep putting carbon into the atmosphere, pretty soon we're going to really regret it. Uh, the notion that, you know, the land needs to be taken care of. I think these very simple notions need to be um, listened to and followed. And do you think, I mean, is it a cliche to think that First Nations communities have that notion clearly in their in their minds more than the, the rest of us? I, I think that there's a danger of it becoming a cliche. I don't think you ever want to oversimplify, of course, uh, because we are complicated people as well. Uh, but I do think that if you are a community that, uh, you know, still practices its traditional fishing practices, that's what my community does, uh, then you are going to be just because you want that fish to still be there, not just next year, but 10, 20 years down the line. Uh, you're going to be more aware of of the impact that industry has mm. on on those things. There might be like some part of the solution in in looking at that way of life. Uh, but when you look at Canada, it's also a country that still ha extracts a lot of its natural resources. Its whole entire economy is based on that. So I mean, no government is ever going to change that. No, I mean, so I think it's it's not necessarily just. It's not just about, you know, the extraction economy. I think it's about, um, you know, what kind of industries are we promoting? Uh, you know, there, yes, Canada has a deep history with the fur trade and timber and now oil and gas of, of extracting resources for wealth. Uh, but that doesn't mean that there are not opportunities for other more sustainable, more cutting edge uh, industries. I think Canada could get itself out of the natural resource trap if they, you know, it's a it's a it's a first world economy that that uh, has educated population. Uh, there's opportunities to invest in technology, opportunities to invest in more sustainable energy sources, uh, clean energy sources, and so I think that. Yes, those resources are always going to be there, and it's almost like an easy piggy bank that you can draw down. Um, but I think that there are more lofty you know, goals that can be aspired to that uh, can benefit everyone, including First Nations. Um, is part of the problem, and, and tell me if this exists universally or not, that, that there's a lot of people still climate denial, still thinking that, well, it's not my problem. Yeah, I think that there's a, so I just mentioned the sort of hard climate denial where you just deny mm. the scientific Fix. fact. Uh, but there's also, I think, uh, a softer climate denial that we all sort of live with, which is that, you know, it's easier at the end of the day to ignore this big picture, long term problem uh, that we are facing. I think that as time goes on, you know, I, I you mentioned I, I'm from California. Uh, there were a, another record-breaking sort of wildfire season. Uh, and I think that as, as those disasters happen, there's also just Hurricane Florence, of course, uh, more and more people are going to become aware and active in what climate change uh, means. Okay, well, let's hope so and, and that we'll finally start acting on it as well. Uh, Julian Noiscat, thanks so much for coming into studio and giving us your time and insight.